Good morning, beautiful people. Hello. Oh, happy Father's Day, everybody. How are we doing, dads? Are we okay? Good. I hope you have an exciting after. I'm, I hope you have a chill afternoon planned with your family and a nice fat steak in your future. All right. We are uh, continuing a series this morning in the book of Hosea, the Old Testament book of Hosea, and I think that Hosea, especially the scripture we're going to look at today, is great for Father's Day. So we're just going to dive right in, okay? We're looking at Hosea, and last week, uh, Tim Porter quoted A.W. Tozer saying, what comes to mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And today, we might add that how those thoughts are formed will determine whether or not those thoughts actually move us and change us. You ask just about any American what they know or what they believe about God, and you're going to probably hear similar things. He's loving and good and compassionate and merciful and just and holy, etc., etc. Those are words we just kind of pick up here and there. Even if you don't uh, go to church, you've probably heard those things. But they can be kind of flat to us. You know what I mean? They're flat. There's not a lot of substance to them. They don't really move us or change us. Uh, what comes to my mind uh, is Flat Stanley. Do you know what a Flat Stanley is or who Flat Stanley is? Okay, if you do, you're probably a teacher or you got kids in school or something like that. So Flat Stanley is a children's book character. He's a little paper man, and what you do if you're a kid is you color in your own Flat Stanley, you know, and then you take him with you on spring break or Christmas vacation or something like that, and you take pictures with Flat Stanley on the roller coaster or whatever it is you're doing, and then you, you know, share those stories and adventures with your classmates, that's Flat Stanley. Well, a lot of people, you know, have a Flat Stanley kind of God. You know, they have these churchy words that they've picked up here and there. Uh, God is holy, righteous, and good, and loving, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but they kind of, you know, color him in in whatever way you know makes the most sense to them, or someone else is coloring him in for them. You know, so uh, Porter talked about this a little bit last week. He talked about, you know. When people talk about losing their religion, or another word would be deconstructing, okay? When I meet people who are deconstructing and I hear about the God being deconstructed, I think, well, it's not a very interesting God. You know, he's, there's not a lot to him, and I would deconstruct him probably as well. But Flat Stanley, as much fun as he is to take along with you on adventures, when you're in trouble, no one turns to Flat Stanley, okay? When your relationships are blowing up, Flat Stanley does not help you in any way. So while he's flexible and fun to bring along, uh, he's, he's not real. And what books like Hosea do is they come along and they fill these churchy words with meaning and power and depth. So we're going to be looking uh, at Hosea chapter 2. We're actually picking up right where we left off last week. That's going to be on page 752, if you want to follow along in the Bibles in front of you. And here's the situation while you're finding Hosea chapter 2, just a reminder. So Hosea was a prophet in Israel about 750 years before the birth of Christ, and it's about 20 years before the destruction of his nation by the Assyrian Empire. God sent Hosea to prepare his people for their annihilation. And this is happening because Israel has given itself to the worship of a Canaanite god named Baal, or Baal, if you live in the Midwest like me, which means my husband or my master. Baal was the god of rain, fertility, good crops, and prosperity, and Israel basically was trusting in him, and they presumed, as we all tend to do, that God would just have to deal with this. God is up in heaven, good for him. We're down here just trying to handle our mess. And it never occurred to them that uh, God would be hurt by this. He's up there, we're down here. It doesn't occur to us often that spiritual adultery is a real thing. And that it really does uh, impact God. And he's not just, he's never just been up there. He is Israel's husband. And so Hosea is a contest between lovers. And with Hosea, God does something unprecedented. He calls Hosea the prophet to marry a prostitute, to marry someone known to be unfaithful and promiscuous, just like Israel, 
and then God tells Hosea to do this and puts his family on display. So Israel doesn't want to listen to God's word anymore, so God gives them his family to live out for them what they're doing to God. They have three children together. Their names are going to come up today, so we'll just review. Their, their names are Jezreel, and then they had a daughter named No Mercy and another daughter named Not My People, and it was super bizarre. The whole family, if you think your family situation is bizarre, really bizarre, painful, public, humiliating. And that was the point. We don't consider that our unfaithfulness to God is, spiritually, uh, is spiritual adultery. And if you had a friend married to someone who was serially unfaithful to them, how would you counsel them? What would you tell them to do? You would tell them to do exactly what God is doing here. Let them go. And that's what God is doing. He's handing his people over to what they want, the Baals or the Baals. But even in wrath, we saw this last week and we're just going to pick right up this week, even in wrath, God cannot let them go without letting them know this is not the end. And this is not the whole story. So let's start uh, right where we left off, chapter 2, verse 21. Here we go. And in that day, the Lord says, I will, or, sorry, in that day I will answer, declares the Lord. I will answer the heavens and they shall answer the earth. And the earth shall answer the grain, the wine, and the oil. And they shall answer Jezreel. And I will sow her for myself in the land. And I will have mercy on no mercy, and I will say to not my people, you are my people. And he shall say, you are my God. And the Lord said to me, go again. Love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisins. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a lethek of barley. And I said to her, you must dwell as mine for many days. You shall not play the whore or belong to another man. So will I also be to you. For the children of Israel shall dwell many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or pillar, without ephod or household gods. Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. And they shall come in fear to the Lord and to his goodness in the latter days. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, real quick, Jezreel is mentioned there in verse 22. Again, if you just look at that real quick. And Porter started talking about this last week, but it's, it's a really interesting thing God is doing there. There's a play on words here. It's a pun. There's some irony. Jezreel is the whole story of humanity in one word. Jezreel is a city in Israel, and it, and it means uh, God sows. Or, the, or God will sow. So the hope there is that Jezreel would have been this, you know, lush and bountiful and rich garden, like a garden of Eden. But it became the site of some of Israel's weirdest, bloodiest, most backward events in their history. Jezreel and Israel also sound almost identical in Hebrew. And so God is just doing a little play on words here, and he's saying to Israel, look, I planted you in this land to bless you. This is what he says to all of us, by the way. I planted you. I sowed you to bless you. You could have been like a garden of Eden. And I wanted to make you a blessing to all the other nations, but you have become a disaster. Just a complete disaster. And Hosea's wife is the illustration of this. Look at uh, chapter 3, verse 1. This is how she's described. She's described as loved by another man and an adulteress, which makes what she's doing sound consensual. But then in verse 2, she has to be bought out of it. Okay, so whatever her intention was, Hosea's wife has fallen into some kind of situation where she's trapped. Presumably, she's caught in some kind of sexual slavery. And that is how idols work. Okay, it always begins consensually. And it always ends in slavery. 
That's why it's such a fearsome thing when God says, I'm going to give you over to the stuff you love. Now, Porter mentioned this last week. We do not worship the Baals today, but we have just as many gods. We just call them different things. So we worship control, beauty, family, money, sports, security, work, pleasure, freedom. We are as polytheistic as any Canaanite that ever walked the earth. An idol is anything we love, we serve, or we trust. And here were some questions Porter asked last week, and I'm just going to remind you of them. What do you make time and financial sacrifices for? What do you worry about? Here's my personal favorite. What do you daydream about? What if you, what if you didn't have it would make your life not worth living anymore? What do you run to for comfort? Whose applause do you long for? These are just examples of ways you can recognize the idols or potential idols of your life. And the thing about idols is that they make us extravagant promises. So they come along and they whisper in your ear, for example, if you were just a little thinner, then men would want you and you'd be happy and never alone. Or they come along and say, if you just made a few thousand dollars more, your wife would respect you and you could take her on vacation, okay? Or just, you know, fill in the blank. That's how idols work. They draw us away from the love of God with these promises and all they ask is this much from you. So in this context, it's just a little burnt offering or in our context, it's just a, a little more of your time or a little more of your money, and then they take, and they take, and they take. Read 1 Kings chapter 18. It describes the priests of Baal at their work. They are dancing around the altar, slashing themselves, trying to get Baal's attention, and chanting themselves silly. And that is what idols do. They're going to make you dance. I mean, you ever had something in your life that you lost control out of? You know what I'm talking about. They're going to make you perform. You want to, if you, you know, you, you convince yourself, if I just lost 10 pounds, then he would want me. How's that go for you? You better dance. That's what it means. So it always begins consensually. Hosea's wife left him because someone was telling her he loved her. And he was going to make her happy. And don't you want to be free from that holier-than-thou, self-righteous husband? And come with me, and you'll be really free. And so she ran away. And before she knew it, she was trapped in some kind of slavery. She is a great picture of what happened to Israel and what, is, and what happens to all of us. This is how one philosopher describes the process. He says, it always begins freely. We have a choice. We freely begin our conversion unto death. We begin with a choice, we wind up with a habit. And the habit slowly converts itself into a kind of slavery that cannot be broken. So something has to step in and save us and that's exactly what God sends Hosea to do. And Hosea is a picture of what God has done for us. So here we see three things. God draws us, he frees us. And he answers us with mercy, okay? He draws us, he frees us, he answers with mercy. So God draws us. Some of this goes back to what we read last week. If you want to just glance up your page at verse 14, this is how the, the whole section began. God says to Israel, therefore behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. And there I will give her her vineyards and make the valley of Achor a door of hope and there she shall answer, as in the days of her youth, as at the time when she came out of the land of Egypt. Okay, if you're a note taker, just write Exodus 19.8 next to that. That's the moment God is talking about. When Israel had just come out of Egypt, they were alone with God in the wilderness and they made promises of love to one another. They covenanted to one another. Exodus 19.8 says that they answered God. They responded to God and they covenanted themselves. They promised to be his. And God is saying, I'm going to take you back to where it all began with us. And I... I 
I want to take you back to where we first fell in love, and I am going to woo you again. You guys ever watch this, you know, romantic comedy? Where it doesn't even have to be a comedy, but you watch these movies where a husband is trying to win over his wife again. So he, he recreates their first date or he tries to recreate the place where they first fell in love. You've you seen these? Have you ever had a guy you know, in your life, a male friend in your life, and you've watched him do this for someone who's kind of treating him with disregard? Doesn't it just, just kind of make it just, ew, right? Just a little, <laughs> like, have some pride, man. What are you doing? But this is exact, this is the way that God is being described. He's putting himself out there again. And it's almost, it's a humili it's humiliating. You're almost embarrassed for him. You just want to say, come on, man. Let her come to you. You know what I mean? Which is terrible dating advice, by the way, gentlemen. But just, just, that's just how it is. I was talking with a friend this week. He, he's reading the Sermon on the Mount. And we came to that place where Jesus says, blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. We're just talking, I think that meekness is a word that all men have to understand. So I said, what, you know, what do you think that this means? And I said, we actually read about this in Hosea last week. This is meekness. Meekness is strength that is ready to humiliate itself for the sake of the one that it loves. Meekness is strength that could crush a person, but instead humiliates himself for the sake of the one that he loves. And that's what God is doing for Israel. And he tells Hosea, I want you to go and do the same. Look at chapter 3, verse 1. The Lord said to Hosea, Go again and love a woman who's loved by another man. It's really striking to me. Go again and love her. He doesn't just say go and get her. Go collar her. Go drag her home. He says go and love her. This thing that I just said I'm going to do for Israel, I want you to do for your wife. Woo her. Allure her. Date her again. Speak tenderly and appeal to her heart. You remember what it was like to ask someone out for the first time? Anybody? I was seven. <laughs> she was 14. <laughs> I asked her to dance. Do you know that look you get when you find gum on the bottom of your shoe? That's how she looked at me. Like, oh, no, gross, get away from me. This is what it's like to put yourself out there, right? You make yourself open to this face. Ugh. And this could have happened. To, how does Hosea know if she's even going to come home with him? How does the Lord know how Israel's going to respond? But this is just as God won't force you to stay, He's not going to come along and beat you into returning either. But He says, I'm going to go, I'm going to lure her, I'm going to woo her. I'm going to win her again. Now, the difference between our love and his is that his is effective all the time. So when we talk about God's you know, sovereignty and salvation, what we mean is he knows what he's doing when he allures you. He knows what he's doing. Romans 2.4 says it's the kindness of God that ultimately leads us to repentance, and that's what's going on here. So that's the first thing. God, if you're here, it's because God has drawn you or he is drawing you, okay? The second is that he sets us free. So if you, again, just look up the page. I'm sorry I don't have this on the screen, but verses 16 and 17, you know, he says, in that day you will call me my husband, you won't call me my Baal, and I'll remove the names of the bales from your mouth. You won't even remember them. We're going to be just done with that. He says, I'm going to take you into the wilderness. I'm going to strip all of these idols off of you. And Hosea has to go and do the same thing for his wife. Remember a couple, from a couple of months ago, redemption is buying someone out of slavery. That's what Hosea goes to do. He's redeeming his wife. 
He goes to whoever this person's house is or this brothel. We don't know where she is with a large sum of money in hand. And he goes to buy back his own wife and pay off her debts. Verse 3, it says, And I said to her, You must dwell as mine for many days. You shall not play the whore or belong to another man. And he, and he adds, So will I also be to you. So God never asks anything of us that he's not already doing himself. Now, you may read verse 3 and say, well, that doesn't sound very romantical. I mean, if you can imagine a romantic comedy where the man says to her, you must come stay with me for many days and stop playing the whore. It doesn't sound very, you know, romantic. But two things. First of all, we're talking about real people. And the second is, if you've ever been in an intervention, this is exactly how they talk. And this is an intervention. And this is how lovers speak to one another when one of them needs to change. And so Hosea goes and not only draws us, but God wants to change us because we are addicts and we need to be brought home. Uh, in, verse, in verse 4, he says, you know, God is going to take away king and prince. He's going to take away sacrifice and pillar, ephod and household gods, all of these things that had become part of Israel's worship of the Baals. He's going to take them out into the wilderness and strip them of all these things. This invasion by Assyria essentially is an intervention. If you've ever had to take someone to treatment or you've been to treatment yourself, you know that it's awful. But this is what God does to set us free. Now, I've been wondering this week how Gomer, that's Hosea's wife, how Gomer felt about all this. I'm operating under the assumption this morning, the Bible never tells us one way or the other, okay, so I'm speculating here, but I'm operating under the assumption that Hosea's love was also effective because they're a picture of what God is going to do to Israel, I am assuming Gomer went home with him, that she returned to her three children, and that over the course of many years, Hosea and Gomer learned to love each other again. I say this because uh, God's love is more than a warm feeling for you. It accomplishes what it sets out to do, and I believe Hosea and Gomer probably experienced the same thing. But, but uh, now I'm speculating. Is everybody okay? Prince is speculating now. We've wandered from the word of God and now we're in Prince's imagination. This is a really fun place to live, by the way, if you're me. I can just imagine because we've all seen this. I've seen this a number of times. You've seen this. Someone gets married. They're not ready to be married. They got married too young or something and they want to be free and so they abandon their spouse. They abandon their children. We've probably all seen this happen. They wind up in some terrible situation. Now they feel trapped and they wake up one day hating their life and they miss home. And their kids are teenagers now and they think, what do my children think of me? They must hate me and they're probably right. And they feel like, what would it even be like to go home again? And then one day your husband arrives at the door with everything needed to pay off your debt and he invites you home. I think there'd be a lot of unbelief. I think there'd be a lot of hope and a lot of unbelief all mingled together. I would imagine that Gomer's confidence in men at this point is at an all-time low. I think that she's deeply suspicious of Hosea's motivation, wouldn't you be? She's used to men taking and taking and taking from her. And so I just imagine them walking home and she's 10 feet behind. They're not speaking to each other yet. They walk in the door. Her teenage daughters go to their rooms and slam the door just to communicate clearly how they feel. I imagine it took a long time before Hosea felt free to touch her, before she felt like a mother again. Why, why did we take that trip down Prince's imagination? Because 
This is what it's like coming home to God sometimes. There's this mingling of hope and unbelief. And we say to ourselves, it just cannot be this easy. Someone said that to me this week. It can't be that easy. Because we're used to our idols that take and take and take. And they want more and they want more and they want more. And if God really knew what I'd done while I was away, it would not be this easy. If he knew about the abortion, if he knew about that relationship, if he knew what was on my computer, if he ever finds out about the blow will fall. You just wait. You watch. What is Hosea showing us about the heart of God? That it really is that easy. And he just wants you to come home. And if you would, he's told you how he'll respond. When people talk about the love of God, sometimes it sounds to me like flat Stanley, like something like a warm, tingly feeling. Here we see in Hosea, the love of God is a husband at the door with your payment in hand, ready to walk you home again if you would just respond. In the, in the poem, verses 21 through 23, the, the resounding refrain is answer, answer, answer. In that day, I will answer, declares the Lord. And the question is, well, answer what? He's talking about answering Israel. In the, in the opening of the poem, if you go back to verses 14, 15, and 16, God is drawing Israel to himself and he's setting her free. Why? There she shall answer. As in the days of her youth, there she will call me my husband again. The whole point of this drawing and setting you free is to bring us to the place where we are ready to answer my husband. And when you call, he has already told you how he'll respond. I will answer you, he says. And there's actually this like chorus of response. It says, in that day I will answer, declares the Lord. I will answer the heavens and they'll answer the earth. The earth will answer the grain, the wine, and the oil. So all of the things that Baal had promised but could not give them, God says, I'm going to give it all to you. And then he goes, and they will answer Jezreel, this place of disaster, and I will sow her for myself in the land. I'm going to make you a garden once again. And there's just this swelling choir of response from God if you would just answer. And I will have mercy, he says. And I will make not my people, my people. And he will say, you are my God. So here's my invitation from Hosea 2 and 3. Maybe you are here today and your life is a disaster. And you are hearing what Hosea is saying. And you are feeling God call you. I want to tell you to answer him. Just answer. And turn around and come home. Second, if you're here and you know that you've done that, I would love for you to remember today. I can remember when I was a teenager knowing a lot about God and not wanting him and looking at him like, ugh, you're pathetic. And I remember how he was patient with me. I would love for you to just remember this morning as we close our time together, just remember all the people, all the circumstances, all the places 
This is why we exist. So 1 Peter chapter 2, we looked at a month ago. 1 Peter chapter 2, he quotes from verse 23. And he says to the church, this is what you were made for. Once you were not a people, now you are a people. Once you'd not received mercy, now you have received mercy. Why? So that we would declare the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his light. I want you to do that this morning. And finally, I think, well, I know, okay, this is not an opinion. I know we're called to imitate God in this way, to love one another in this way. And I'm just going to say, because it's Father's Day, especially men. So I have permission to share this story with you. I was at a funeral this week. Some of you know Colonel Marty Best is part of our church here. Marty's uh, wife passed away um, kind of unexpectedly last week, and I was at her funeral on Wednesday. They were married for uh, 49 and a half years. They were this close to their 50th wedding anniversary. He became a Christian 24 years ago. So halfway through their marriage, Marty became a follower of Jesus, and he set out to faithfully love his wife. And he loved her and loved her and loved her. And he invited her to church and he shared the gospel with her and invited her to Alpha, introduced her to his Christian friends and prayed for her and prayed for her. I've known Marty for 10 years and in that whole time, that, that was always his number one prayer request. Would you pray that my wife would come to know Jesus as I've come to know him? And toward the end, she uh, slipped into a coma. This was Monday or Tuesday. And Marty shared at the funeral that he, he had heard somewhere that hearing is the last thing to go. And so he sat at her bedside as she lay in a coma. He got out his Alpha Manual and he read to her about the love of God in Christ Jesus and the plan of salvation. And he said to her, I want to see you in heaven. I want to see you. And I thought to myself, God, would you make every man at Faith Community Church like that. That we would have the meekness of Christ Jesus which brings its strength and humiliates itself if it has to be done to pursue and to love and to have the one it's promised to love. This is what we are made for and called for. Let's pray. I'm going to invite you to pray wherever you are, just, just between you and the Lord. And if you know that you need to respond to him this morning, I ask that you would. And I want to invite you to remember the way that God drew you and freed you and made you his own. Father in heaven, I remember how you treated me and how you called me. And I ask, we ask together as your people that you would do it again and again. We have children we're waiting on. We ask that you would do for them what you've done for us, that you would allure them, that you would speak tenderly to them again and we pray for our city our neighbors our county God why why would you call us and not others we ask that you would show mercy to those who've not known mercy and make them your people who are not yet your people we ask this in Jesus name amen Let's stand and sing.